Hello everyone, I'm Laurel Buxbaum, and today I'm going to give a talk called The Ways You Do the Things You Do, Left Hemisphere Representation and Selection of Tool Knowledge. But before I do, I would like to dedicate this talk to the memory of Professor Frida Newcomb, who was a British clinical neuropsychologist who played a central, even pivotal role in the development of the discipline of cognitive neuropsychology. I'd also like to take a minute to say that I'm really so delighted and honored to receive the Frida Newcomb Prize and to be asked to give this lecture. My friends and admired colleagues in the British Neuropsychological Society have long been a source of great inspiration to me. So thank you very, very much. When you look at this object, which is a MIDI controller, you don't need to know anything about it or what it is even, even though I just told you, to figure out that you could reach out and poke the buttons and turn the dials and play with the keys. And before long, you might be able to figure out some things that you can do with it. But that contrasts with a skilled user of this tool who knows exactly what will happen when he or she turns the dials and presses the buttons based on their experience with using that tool in a functional way based on learned stored information. And that contrast between what the object tells you to do based on its structure, bottom up, versus what you bring to bear based on your knowledge and experience is a fundamental distinction that I will be returning to at several points uh, during the talk. So today I will uh, tell you about two major things. Uh, in the first part of the talk, I'm going to focus on the distinction between structural versus functional aspects of tool processing. Structure is that sort of bottom up information uh, versus function knowledge driven information. And then in, in the second part, I'm going to dig a little deeper uh, into uh, how and in which brain regions tool use information is learned, organized, activated, and selected. Okay, so let's uh, get to part one, uh, the structural and functional aspects of tool processing and the mechanisms and critical brain regions. And uh, critical brain regions, we, we can infer by studying patients who've had lesions who are no longer able to do certain things. Uh, and with that knowledge, we can understand what those parts of the brain are important for. And, and that is a, uh, a lesson that I'm sure I, uh, I don't need to, to teach this particular audience. So a thread throughout the, my talk today will be a focus on limapraxia which is a very interesting um, and common disorder that occurs after left hemisphere stroke. It's associated with deficits in pantomime of tool actions with problems in actual tool use, uh, imitation of meaningful and meaningless actions bilaterally, bilaterally meaning with both hands and problems with action recognition. And most stroke patients have at least some impairment of the right hand and arm and so we often test them with the less impaired left hand. Apraxia significantly impacts stroke disabil survivors' disability and caregiver burden, and it's the single greatest predictor of disability in activities of daily living in left hemisphere stroke. And there's been a great deal of historical and even current confusion about these term, uh, the terminology, uh, characteristics of different subtypes, for example, ideate motor uh, versus ideational versus frontal apraxia and its neuroanatomic substrates. So in my lab, we study apraxia. We also study neurotypical subjects uh, where our interests are in understanding how the brain represents uh, tool knowledge uh, and tool actions. And, and also understanding limapraxia and, and how to treat it. 
So before I go further, I'd like to show you some videos of a patient with apraxia. Um, this is after a left hemisphere stroke. Uh, she has been asked to show how she would hold and use the tool on the table in front of her, a scissors, uh, with her less impaired left hand. And she knows that she has to show the uh, pantomime, the action as though she were holding and using the tool. And you can see that despite her ability to name the object and in fact, to tell us many things about this tool, she is unable to demonstrate how to use it. And you'll see one of the characteristic errors that we see often in apraxia, which is a difficulty positioning the hand properly for using the object. In the second video, this same patient has been told that she now can reach out and grab the object and show how to use it. And uh, I want you to notice uh, two things about her performance. Show me how you would hold it. First is that she takes it properly um, without hesitation and puts her fingers through the holes in the scissors. Um, nevertheless, when she performs that cutting motion, the plane of the trajectory of the action is not functional. Uh, so uh, she cuts side, sideways, whereas in order to use the tool functionally, you'd have to cut perpendicular to the body and neurotypical subjects don't make that error. So there's a trajectory problem. There is a spatial error in her trajectory. And this is a, also a very common kind of error that we see with these patients. Now, in this final video from this patient, uh, she has been told that on each trial, she will see either a small widget shape, which she has to pinch, or a bigger dowel that she has to clench, and she won't know how it's going to be oriented, but all she has to do is reach out and grab or pinch, grasp or pinch the object in a comfortable way using that same left hand. And what I want you to notice is that she reaches out and without hesitation, she adopts her wrist rotation and the size of the, her grasp aperture uh, in a way that's suitable with the structure of that object. And in fact, her performance is indistinguishable from that of neurotypical subjects. So you see here three videos of the same subject, same hand, going from perplex, uh, impaired performance on pantomime, some aspects of her performance with actual tool use is pre preserved and other aspects are impaired. Um, whereas when she has to reach to and grasp uh, currently visualized shapes, she is unimpaired. So that distinction is one that, um, that I'll keep coming back to. So when we started doing this work, uh, there was and remains a, a justly influential model of, of two visual systems in the brain. Uh, that was originally uh, proposed by Unger, Leiter, and Mishkin based on work in, um, in non-human primates, um, and then later developed further uh, by Goodell and Milner based on uh, both in work on primates and uh, in primates and in humans. And the basic idea of which, uh, uh, with which many of you will be familiar is that there is a dorsal stream, which is specialized uh, for vision for action, and a ventral stream, which is uh, specialized for vision for proprioception. And the dorsal stream is critical for reaching to and grasping and looking at uh, currently visualized objects, whereas the ventral stream is critical for object recognition and semantic knowledge. And as I said, most of you will be familiar with this concept. But when you think about it, this two system model doesn't really explain the performance of the patient I just showed you because she does well on some action tasks and not other action tasks. And it suggested to us that we need to expand this two root model. So in 2001, and then uh, in, a, in some later work, um, including uh, this uh, paper, Binkowski and Boxbaum, we developed a two action systems hypothesis. And the hypothesis contrasts uh, a bilateral move network, which is uh, the dorsodorsal network, uh, 
with a left hemisphere lateralized tool use network, which is the ventrodorsal network. And these two systems are uh, specialized for different aspects of, of tool actions. The, the bilateral move network is specialized for currently visualized uh, objects, actions based on currently visualized objects. Um, whereas the left lateralized system is specialized for remembered trajectories and postures. The dorsal dorsal stream is a system that is based on current visual guidance and um, the information in that system is uh, evanescent, is rapidly decaying. Whereas the left hemisphere tool use network is specialized for predictive actions based on how, uh, based on a stored representation of what the actions are supposed to look and feel like. And I'm going to say more about that in a minute. And again, the uh, move system is based on affordance driven structure based actions, whereas the uh, use system is based on memory driven uh, function based actions. And patients with apraxia, we hypothesized are impaired in, in the latter. And so they should and do perform relatively better when there's currently visualized information and relatively more poorly when the information has to be gleaned from, uh, from uh, memory. So let me, I'm going to now give you uh, an example of an earlier study in which we tested this hypothesis uh, by uh, training patients uh, both with and without apraxia, all of whom had left hemisphere stroke, to pair actions videos with novel tools. And these tools were ancient Finnish tools um, with which the subjects were unfamiliar. I, um, and we tested that. Um, and I assume that most of you, or not, if not all of you are unfamiliar with these ancient Finnish tools. And in half the videos, the, the, um, the actions were uh, highly afforded by the tool. That is the shape and size of the actions were appropriate for the shape and size of the tool. And in the other half of the video, the action videos, the actions were ill afforded by the tools. So that, for example, there might be a video showing a pinching gesture uh, being used with a tool like this, uh, for which it's hard to imagine how a pinching gesture uh, would, would work. And what we were interested in is whether patients with apraxia had disproportionate difficulty in learning to produce and recognize these pairings for low afforded tools versus high afforded tools, as you might expect based on the two, two action system hypothesis. And indeed, while patients with apraxia were more impaired overall, uh, this is data from uh, the, the recognition task in which subjects were shown a video and then had to pick out which tool went with that video. The patients with apraxia weren't as good at it as patients without apraxia, even though these subjects were um, matched for overall severity, but they had even more trouble when the tool and action pairing was poorly afforded. So there's something about that um, reliance on, on that sort of uh, an abstraction, uh, something that is not directly driven by the shape and structure of the object that's particularly hard for them. Okay, so now I'm gonna move on a little bit and I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, what are these representations that enable us to remember these uh, tool use actions and what, and what part of the brain are they stored? And, and what is their format? What is the nature of these representations? Uh, and based on prior uh, hypotheses in the literature, um, we, we imagined that these were likely to be something akin to a gesture engram, which has also been called the time space form picture of the movement, um, or uh, in other words, what tool actions look like. 
And so we did a, a, a voxel-based lesion symptom mapping study, which is a technique uh, with which some of you may be familiar, in which we assess whether uh, which, uh, which voxels, when lesioned, give rise to disrupted performance. And we perform a statistical test in each voxel, of course, controlling for multiple comparisons. Uh, and we get a statistical map of the lesions that are significantly associated with impairment in uh, one task or another. Um, and in this study, Tarhan, Watson, and Buxbaum, we contrasted gesture recognition and gesture production, and we residualized those two tasks to remove the shared variance so we could look at what proportion of their performance variance was uniquely uh, uh, associated with lesions in one brain region or another. And what we found is that gesture recognition, uh, being able to uh, match verbs to gesture videos, relies on this posterior temporal occipital region in the left hemisphere. Whereas uh, production of gestures, uh, uh, whether meaningful or meaningless uh, gestures, so imitating meaningless actions or producing uh, tool related gestures relies much more heavily on the inferior parietal lobe here, the supermarginal gyrus. Um, and, and, and the in, inferior frontal gyrus and the middle frontal gyrus. So I wanna get back for a minute to sort of what is the format of these gesture knowledge representations. Um, and, and, and one of the things we noticed based on the location of this and based on a number of fMRI studies that have looked at human movement processing is that this region in the posterior temporal lobe overlapped heavily uh, quite a lot with a, uh, this region in red, which is human movement uh, sensitive cortex, HMT plus, uh, uh, which th uh, this red is a mask derived from fMRI studies. Uh, and so the, the region that when lesion gives rise to gesture recognition problems is uh, heavily overlapping with movement sensitive cortex, uh, which suggested again to us that uh, the format of the nature of these representations uh, maybe in terms of what, uh, what these actions, tool use actions look like. Okay, so um, now I'm going to return back to the idea of uh, contrasting move and use representations uh, in the next section of my talk. So uh, we reason that if there are indeed deficits uh, of the tool use system in these tool use representations, um, we should see impaired performance uh, when we pit one of these against the other. So when use and move actions conflict. And moreover, that we should really see that tool use network driven hard uh, when, tool, uh, when these move and use actions conflict. Uh, that, that, um, that, that, that left lateralized system is really critical for that use component and for, for being able to activate and select it. Uh, when it's appropriate. And we can test that by looking at these so-called conflict objects. So um, we developed a, a, a nice set of objects, uh, some of which uh, for um, uh, use and move actions are in conflict. So for example, this pump soap dispenser, you would move it, pick it up and put it on a shelf um, with this kind of hand posture, whereas you would use it like this, and so there's a conflict there uh, versus uh, a, an object like this uh, where you would pick it up and move it uh, with this hand posture and you would use it with this hand posture. And by the way, hand posture proves to be a, quite a sensi sensitive part of the gesture that we've returned to time and time again to try to understand um, gesture representations. Um, and so what we did is we had subjects both with and without apraxia pantomiming how to use these conflict and no conflict objects uh, with their uh, less impaired left hand. Um, and, and then we scored their performance for accuracy using a, a, a detailed coding system that's a, a reliable system that's been long in use in my lab. Um, and here's an example of one of these patients uh, who is shown a picture of a, uh, this object, a scissors, and asked to produce uh, a pantomime 
And one of the things I want you to notice is how many different postures she produces. Um, so there, she knows that it, she's not correct uh, by virtue of the fact that she keeps trying and even her facial expression, um, she's flipping her hand over, she's repositioning her fingers, she's um, trying again and again, and she's looking at her hand and she, she doesn't get it. In this case, she knows she, she didn't get it. Um, and um, indeed, uh, she, she and others, uh, apraxics, uh, make many more of these errors uh, with conflict tools than with non-conflict tools. So this suggested to us that competition between the, gra the, the move and the use actions is really a potent source of errors, pantomime errors uh, in, uh, in apraxia. And here's hand posture accuracy on this axis. Uh, and I should have said, this is a uh, beautiful work of Christine Watson, a former postdoc. Now, the lesions, we also looked at the lesions associated with, uh, with uh, these uh, impairments, both in overall pantomiming, as well as particular difficulty with conflict tools, uh, controlling for non-conflict tools. And we found different patterns. So what we found here is characteristic of what most many investigators have found with apraxia, which is that a, a broad region of the left hemisphere is critical in praxis, uh, both the temporal lobe, the parietal lobe, the frontal lobe, uh, are a, a part of why it's been so difficult to kind of nail down. The apraxia syndrome is it's, it's quite a, a distributed region that's, uh, that's critical for, pra for praxis. Uh, but most importantly here was the fact that when we looked at uh, the variance in performance of conflict objects uh, controlling for non-conflict, we got a very interesting subset of these regions, uh, which included the supermarginal gyrus and the inferior frontal gyrus. And these two regions we've seen in our work uh, again and again. Um, and based on this and other studies, we hypothesize that these, this portion of the tool use network is particularly critical for a buffering candidate tool actions, uh, use actions, move actions, and selecting the appropriate action based on context. Now, this, this study, another one I showed you earlier, are both voxel-based lesion symptom mapping studies. Uh, we, in later work, we've also done a multivariate um, version of this called uh, a support vector regression lesion symptom mapping. Um, uh, it's similar, um, uh, but the bottom line is those approaches are look at uh, lesioned voxels. And another question that many of you might thinking is um, what about the networks that are important for, for tool use? What about the connectivity between these regions and how they may uh, impact uh, tool, uh, tool action production? Uh, so we've done a, a, a couple of connectivity studies. I want to tell you about today. Uh, we asked uh, patients to gesture pantomime uh, both conflict and non-conflict objects. So these are the conflict, some of the conflict objects. These are some of the non-conflict objects. Um, and we, uh, we paired uh, this with a resting state connectivity analysis. So patients uh, lay in the scanner uh, and, did, um, and just did thought about whatever they wanted to or nothing, uh, as long as they didn't fall asleep, it was all, it was all good. Uh, and then we asked, whether uh, correlations between regions, which is uh, the basis for resting state connectivity, whether that correlation was associated with performance and whether changes or disruptions in that correlation were associated with disrupted performance. We did this in a data-driven way. So we had, um, we had 32 regions of interest and we looked at pairwise functional connectivity uh, between all of those 32 regions. Uh, and we were interested not only in overall pantomime uh, performance and uh, as well as the um, uh, conflict uh, performance. And what we found is that uh, this on the left is a schematic of, of 
some of the most uh, strongest, most potent disconnections associated with impaired performance. Um, and yellow is overall accuracy. Uh, in blue is conflict scores, both on the left and right, and red are both measures. Um, and perhaps you can appreciate here that uh, overall accuracy uh, was uh, changes, reductions in overall pantomime accuracy were uh, associated with bilateral uh, disconnect, with connectivity, uh, interhemispheric disconnectivity. Whereas uh, the conflict scores uh, disconnection to a much more strongly left lateralized set of regions was associated with uh, poor performance, in particular uh, to conflict objects. On the right, there's another thing that I want you to notice, which is that in addition to that strong left lateralization for these conflict objects, you can see uh, that it is much more centralized and perisylvian as compared to uh, the patterns of disconnectivity, the nodes that when disconnected are associated with overall pantomime performance. Um, and um, it, this is a, an exploded brain. So this is really kind of right along the Sylvian fissure, uh, the IFG, um, a little bit of the temporal lobe, but the supermarginal gyrus. And we think that this region here is really, uh, as you saw in the, uh, a few slides back, this supermarginal gyrus IFG region is really important for, uh, for buffering candidate actions. When I say buffering, I mean that in, in, a, in a kind of working memory sense, it's very briefly held online uh, while a biasing signal can exert a, a, its influence to enable a, a selection of, of a task appropriate action. So um, based on these and other data, we expanded our two action system model uh, beyond the move and use system, which I, I showed you earlier in a table uh, to include this, uh, this additional module, a third module uh, of the tool use, uh, the two action system network. And we call this the two action system plus model. And the plus in the model refers to this action selection system, uh, which is comprised of uh, the SMG, which is a, a neural accumulator for action competitors uh, and the IFG, which serves to provide a goal or context biasing signal. And you can see this um, in this paper here. So in the next part of the talk, I am going to uh, dive more deeply into how and in which brain regions tool action knowledge is uh, organized, activated, and selected. Uh, and, and in order to do that, I'm gonna provide a, a little brief tutorial uh, about um, uh, sort of about semantic memory and competition. So, in the semantic memory literature, it, it's, it's been appreciated for quite some time that um, competition between entities, between memories, is determined in part by their proximity in semantic feature space. And what do we mean by feature space? Well, fe semantic features are things like the material that, that an entity, an object, uh, an animal, a fruit, a vegetable is made of, uh, is it circular? What's the shape of, of, that, of that object? Um, uh, what color is the object? And um, in, in studies uh, like this one and many, many others, um, it has been shown time and time again that um, in both priming and interference studies that the closeness or the degree of overlap or shared features determines how much priming or competition um, objects show. So things close in space tend to interfere or prime one another depending on the paradigm. Things far or very different, uh, either in color or in shape or in all of the above, uh, tend to not cause much interference. So uh, the, this uh, similar work had not been done in the, in the domain of tool actions. Um, and um, indeed the notion even that uh, tool actions could be semantic uh, was not something that had really been entertained. So uh, one more bit of the tutorial before I go on to uh, another, another finding. 
Um, and, and that this will help you think about the different kinds of competition uh, that might happen between tool actions. And, and to think about the fact that competition allows us to understand um, the mechanisms of action representation and selection. So if, if, if you saw an object like this uh, and, and you were asked to pick it up, even if you didn't know what it was, it was a, a, a real 3D object, you'd be able to reach out and pick up the object based on its shape and size. And, and, and we've reviewed that already. Now, if you were asked to use the object, on the other hand, uh, you would need to know some things about it. Uh, you might need to know what it's called, but even if you forgot that, you would need to at least know what it was for. Um, and you'd need some, some bit of, of, of ability to, to represent it semantically. You need to, to know what the object is. Uh, and so here for shorthand, I've, I've labeled it you would need to know that it, it's a key, whatever that means. Um, now we hypothesize that when you think about a key, part of what's entailed is that you activate the action features that are associated with keys. And those might include an extended arm, a, a twisting wrist, a pinched hand. Um, and moreover, that there are other objects that are also associated with an extended arm, a twisting wrist, uh, and or a pinched hand. And that those similar actions, which are, which are semantic features, lead to between tool competition between different use actions should lead to different kinds of competition if we're right. And that contrasts with what I've already told you about several times, which is the conflict between uh, moving and using objects. Okay. So um, uh, some of our work has looked at validating, uh, the testing and validating these ideas. Um, and, and one of the studies I'll, I'll uh, share with you uh, is a, uh, a study, another study done by uh, Christine Watson, um, in which uh, neurotypical subjects were given uh, a whole bunch of pictures of manipulable objects, and they were asked to sort them into piles based on how similar their actions were. And so, um, as a first pass, people tended to be uh, pretty meticulous um, and only put sort things together into a pile with other objects that were used with quite a similar action um, and maybe only have two or three objects in that pile. But we said, okay, now you've got to combine those piles and we want you to make fewer piles. So put them together with things that are used more or less similarly and keep doing that and keep doing that. Make taller stacks of fewer piles. And then we looked at the sorting solutions across a number, quite a number of subjects. Um, and we, uh, we looked at, uh, we did a hierarchical clustering analysis to look at how people tended to sort them. And you can see, for example, that a calculator and keyboard were, were sorted as being quite similar in their use actions. And, and a saw and a, and a uh, paint roller were sorted as being quite similar. Um, uh, and then in the next stage, uh, we uh, performed a multi-dimensional scaling uh, analysis with the, those sorting solutions, um, uh, orthogonalized uh, the, the axes that were generated, and then in a post hoc way, looked, looked at what we had and looked at whether it made any sense, and indeed it, it seemed to. Um, and what we saw was uh, what we think are uh, what we thought were uh, a, a cluster of objects that were used with similar arm actions, like a paint roller, a peeler, a paintbrush, all have um, this kind of large uh, arm action, and objects that seem to cluster together uh, because they uh, they used uh, similar hand actions. So, for example, a hair clip and a spray bottle. Um, and moreover, um, 
when we looked, we saw that objects down here like a soap dispenser and a hole puncher are used with a non-prehensile hand posture, whereas the objects up here tended to be used with a, uh, a prehensile, and there are many more of those posture. Okay, so now how do we go about validating this is all done with, uh, done with this weird sorting paradigm and, and how do we know this really impacts anyone's behavior? Uh, and so what we, what we did next was use something um, that, um, that is, uh, has one of the tasks that has been used a lot in the semantic memory literature, uh, which is to see whether people had more trouble with objects uh, doing word picture matching with objects that are close versus far in this in this space. And so we uh, developed three, uh, three groups of objects. Uh, uh, one group had high action similarity. These are all used as an example with a twisting action, um, uh, a moderate action similarity and an unrelated uh, set of objects. And subjects, neurotypical subjects had to perform a word picture matching task where they uh, we, they saw and it went pretty darn fast. Uh, so they would see a word like this, and then they had to uh, pick out which of those two objects uh, was denoted by the word. And our prediction was that indeed, if uh, tool action similarity uh, influences um, is a is a determinant of performance on this kind of word picture matching task. Um, uh, a task, by the way, in which action is completely irrelevant for performing the task, then we should see neighborhood effects. So we should see people doing worse with things that are close. And indeed, that's what we saw. So objects that were, uh, were closer in this neighborhood space uh, were less accurate than objects that were further. And, uh, and those in deep turn were less accurate than those that were unrelated. Um, uh, so, uh, so this it was a demonstration to us that yes, uh, tool actions are a semantic feature um, and they display uh, uh, some, of the, um, some of the patterns that we've come to, to know and expect with other semantic features. So now I'm going to turn to uh, another aspect of, of these tool action uh, semantic representations. Um, uh, you, you recall that I talked about uh, the fact that in the use system, the activations are slower acting because they're drawn from memory uh, than in the move system where we think the actions are, mo are uh, driven by current visual information and more rapidly decay. So the next study uh, I'm going to tell you about looked at the time course of action, activation of tool action, um, tool actions, um, and uh, uh, to repeat, uh, I, I just told you, a move is faster and rapidly decaying, and use is slower and longer lasting. And we used conflict objects to test the hypothesis: conflict and no conflict objects. And we used uh, something called the visual world paradigm, which has been used uh, to look uh, at semantic and phonological representations in the language domain. And the basic paradigm is, is this. Um, people see an array of objects and they're, uh, they can look at, they are enabled to look at the array uh, for a few seconds, and then they hear the name of a target object, and they have to look at it and click on it with their mouse. Now, in the variant that we did, what we were interested in is competition um, that is caused by use competitors. Um, and so we used conflict objects, uh, such as this one. And, and the distractor of interest was a competitor that is used with a similar action. Uh, however, what's important, it's not picked up and moved with a similar action. So this car key fob would be picked up with a much smaller hand posture than the, than the uh, TV remote. And also in the array were some unrelated objects. So the, in some trials, we had this kind of uh, situation. Uh, where we had a use competitor. And in other trials, we had a move competitor. So the competitor object was picked up uh, and moved with a similar action, uh, but not used with a similar action. And again, unrelated objects. 
And what we're interested in this visual world paradigm and what's uh, characteristic is that over time, uh, people fixate more and more on the target uh, and less and less on a competitor, okay? But that it takes a while to, to stop engaging attention on the, uh, on the, on the competitor. And uh, in contrast, an unrelated object is not really looked at very much. And by the way, uh, these objects are all, were all balanced in terms of their visual attributes. Um, and what we're interested in here is the uh, disparity between looks to the competitor object and the unrelated object. So in neurologically healthy participants, um, we looked at the time course of looks to these two types of competitors grasp to use, move, I'm sorry, and use competitors. And we're looking here in this graph at the difference in fixation proportion of the interesting competitor versus the unrelated competitor. Uh, and you can see that uh, the looks to grasp to move uh, uh, competitors peaks at about 700 milliseconds and then decays rapidly. Whereas looks to the use competitor peaks quite a bit later at around a thousand milliseconds and those looks continue much longer. So it's harder to resolve that competition. And so this was a validation to us that uh, these two different kinds of actions associated with tools have different characteristics of activation. Now, you might already be thinking and wondering, what about patients? And so in our next study, we looked at use competition in apraxic and non-apraxic stroke patients. And our prediction was that apraxic patients in particular should show abnormalities in their looks to these use competitors, uh, and perhaps even uh, slowing of the activation of, the, of, the, of those use competitors. So here, are what I've graphed is uh, uh, both the uh, competitor object looks uh, in red uh, versus uh, the um, unrelated objects in gray. And in, in this graph, what we're interested in is the peak of difference between looks to those, uh, and we can see that it happens about here. Sorry, I don't have a time, uh, time stamp on the x-axis here. Uh, but what's important is that in the, in the apraxic subjects, the peak look to uh, the uh, use competitors is significantly later. And Importantly, that the degree of slowing, this difference between the apraxics and non, is determined by the degree of deficit in pantomime of tools. And so what we think we're getting here is that part of the reason these subjects have trouble with pantomime is because these representations are abnormally activated when they look at tools. Um, and it's hard to activate them, it's slow to activate them, and that time course is just uh, not adequate for performing pantomime and even uh, tool use actions. So what I've shown you is that patients with apraxia exhibit increased vulnerability to competition and deficits in action selection on both implicit and explicit tasks. And uh, we think this is a major source of apraxic errors. The slow weak activation leads to increased vulnerability to competition. And there's another deficit that we think might be, uh, might result from this slow and weak activation, which are problems in, um, in using, uh, in, in predicting actions online uh, and an increased reliance on visual feedback. So if that move system is rel relatively intact, uh, if people can use current information to guide their actions, perhaps they will be over-reliant on that information. Um, and, and, and this suggests that there will be a predictive coding deficit and over-reliance on increased feed, over-reliance on visual information and increased feedback dependence. So, um, so uh, one way you can probably appreciate uh, the difference between feedback and feed forward uh, actions, if you aren't familiar with the concept, is to think about 
when you take a shower at somebody else's house for the first time and um, you're standing in the shower and you are trying to get it hotter and you turn the dial and um, suddenly it's scalding hot and you turn it down and then it's icy cold and you turn it up a little and it's still too hot and you kind of can go on doing this for quite a while. Uh, we've, we've all been there. Uh, and this illustrates a feedback driven action where you're waiting for that delayed water temperature to catch up with your action and you're adjusting your action belatedly based on, um, based on the feedback that you're getting from the world. Versus when you're in your own shower, you know exactly where, what the dial looks like when it's turned the right way, and you know what how to move your hand to turn it just the right way, and you can effortlessly predict just how warm that water will be. So that's a feedback versus feed forward driven uh, action. Um, now, in our one of our earlier studies, this is work of Steve Jacks, a former postdoc, um, we looked at the role of visual feedback dependence in praxis um, in imitation actions. And so here the task was quite simple. A subject simply had to uh, uh, imitate an examiner uh, who was positioning a video of an examiner who was positioning his hand uh, relative to another part of the body. And I, I don't have time today, but this body relative posturing is quite hard for these patients. Um, and they, the patients were allowed in one condition to look at their hand and imitate, and in another condition, they were blindfolded and then imitate. And the delay was the same for both. So there wasn't any extra memory requirement on this. And as this example uh, illustrates and what we, we showed in uh, many of the subjects, um, the, the performance was not great to begin with. Um, even when looking directly at the hand, uh, but further uh, was further impaired, was more impaired when they were blindfolded. Uh, and so to, just to, I haven't talked that much about imitation, I'm really focusing on tool use here. And so what we wondered in the study I'm about to tell you about is what is the role of vision in a praxis ability to uh, detect and correct their action errors? Uh, you noticed that subject I showed you earlier was looking at her hand a lot. What happens when people can't look at their hand? Are they able to get it right after all those tries? Um, and so in this study with, with a former student, Courtney Howard, um, we, uh, we asked people to imitate, uh, sorry, gesture to the site of tools, uh, much like uh, the ones I showed you earlier, but I'll show you another video because for many of us videos are, uh, a very interesting part of what we do. Uh, the performance is an interesting part. And so yeah, this is a subject who um, was showing how to use, gesture the use of a key. And um, he does the same thing that you saw in the other patient, which is to produce a number of different actions, uh, to change his posture many times. Um, um, and uh, there was a little bit of a twisting action for a second there. Um, yeah. Now in this case, he thinks that he got it right and he stopped it. He wanted to go on to the next trial. So we were really interested in when people stop, uh, do they, are they ending on a correct action or not when they're blindfolded or not blindfolded? And what you see here is that um, when people had blindfolds on, um, with, so with NVF means no visual feedback, um, these are the proportion of their errors that they were able to correct. Um, and with visual feedback, here's the proportion of errors they were able to correct. And you can see that indeed, when they could see their hands, they were much more likely to get those actions right. And so they're really abnormal, and that is not true of neurotypical subjects or non-apraxics. So these patients are really abnormally dependent on vision uh, uh, in part, we think, because that the bottom up, the, the information that they need to activate from memory is not there in the right place in the right time. So I'm just gonna summarize what I've, I've told you thus far. Uh, first, that tool use depends on the left ventrodorsal stream. 
Um, I, I uh, showed you that uh, in particular, we think we and others think that the posterior temporal lobe is really an important uh, repository for tool use knowledge or tool action semantics, and that it may be uh, stored in, a, uh, uh, in terms of the visual appearance of tool actions. Uh, and then I briefly touched on the idea that the parietal lobe in contrast might be important for uh, knowing how tool use actions are supposed to feel and also for sort of buffering those candidate tool representations uh, prior to selection. I also uh, told you that a slow and weak activation of tool knowledge in apraxia uh, leads to deficits in uh, predictive processing and, uh, and abnormal visual feedback dependence um, and deficits in resolving competition um, and selecting uh, tool relevant actions. Uh, and I, uh, uh, I gave you a little bit of an overview of, of the, some of the nodes and connections of the tool use network. Uh, so let me just return for, for one minute in my last couple of slides to the idea of ideational ideomotor and frontal apraxia, which has been floating around uh, in the literature for, for many years. And, 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 um, and, and we label the, these subtypes a little differently um, based on the underlying mechanisms that we think are impaired um, and, um, and, and, and suggest that Though these subtypes, while overlapping, um, uh, may be associated with relatively uh, posterior versus more anterior lesions. Um, and that uh, the posterior subtype, uh, we could call representational apraxia. This is akin to uh, what has been termed ideational apraxia. Uh, uh, but critically, uh, the tests for this uh, neuropsychological test would be a recognition um, of gesture with better imitation of meaningless actions because it's the knowledge of those to stored tool actions that are impaired with no fundamental problem in that input output mapping of uh, uh, translating visual information into motor information, which is what the parietal system does. Um, whereas people with parietal lesions, uh, we could characterize as spatial temporal apraxia, uh, we expect the, the hallmark of this type to be uh, imitation of meaningless actions should be impaired with better recognition of actions. And then finally, selection apraxia, which we think should be associated with uh, IFG lesions, uh, uh, is a problem with, uh, we should see multiple error responses uh, and poor correction of errors. Now, as I said, of course, these subtypes overlap and you need big groups of, of subjects and you need to be able to parcel out that shared variance. Uh, but this is a model that we are, uh, we are currently testing in my lab. Um, and so for the final, um, the final slide, I just want to, to, to say, what, do we, what, what does this suggest about how to rehabilitate these subjects, uh, these patients? Um, now, um, clearly all three of these subtypes are deficient in some aspect of representing or translating or selecting action knowledge. And so what we wanna do is strengthening the retrieval, the representation and the selection of tool actions. Um, and there's at least two ways to do to do this. Um, one of them is uh, could be uh, a way uh, could be borrowed from the semantic uh, and, and aphasia literature, uh, and, and this is a method that's been used with great success uh, in in naming deficits in aphasia, um, and um, it, it's uh, exemplified by semantic feature analysis. Um, in which people are asked to name a target picture, but they also are asked to produce the use of the, of the object, um, how it's used, what it's for, where it's used, who would use it, what other objects it's associated with, and name it, and answer all these questions, and name it, and answer these questions, and name it over repeated trials. And so the idea here is that you're co-activating all of these semantic features with the name. And so um, one possibility is that that approach might be helpful for some apraxics who have trouble co-activating action semantics with other aspects of action knowledge. 
Another approach has been used with um, some success uh, in apraxia, and that's simply a much more practice-based approach in which you, you see an object, you show how you would use it, you see someone uh, see a, a, a video of someone doing it, you have to imitate it through a different, a lot of different set of, of um, tasks, you produce an action over and over and over. And it's just, it's very a practice-based approach, but really focusing on that uh, spatio-temporal action. And, and we, in this study, we, uh, with uh, um, uh, some former postdocs, Harrison Stoll, um, Matt DeWitt, um, we uh, showed that some patients respond, uh, it was a small study because training studies take a long time, uh, but some subjects uh, respond to each of these approaches. And the next step is to then see whether patients who fit in with one or other of those subtypes of apraxia do better with one or another of these approaches. And with that, I wanna thank you very much for your attention and um, uh, this is my my lab um, on on Zoom. <laughs> uh, I'm sure it's a familiar type of image uh, to all of us uh, these days. Unfortunately, um, I want to thank um, them um, and my uh, former uh, collaborators, um, also um, NIH uh, for supporting my work and Moss Rehabilitation Research Institute. Thank you so much. <laughs>